Welcome to Mass Musings, a podcast where art and history come together. Brought to you by the Maslin Museum. On today's episode of Mass Musings, we interview current Studio M artist Rebecca Cross about her exhibition, Suspended Animations, which is currently on view in the Maslin Museum's Studio M from May 8th through June 16th, 2021. Through large-scale drawings and installations, Suspended Animations considers the current moment in the context of an environmentally fragile world. She is known internationally for her exhibitions of silk sculptures and installations. Hi, and welcome to Mass Musings. My name is Emily Vigil, and I am Studio M Coordinator here at Maslin Museum. I'd like to introduce Anna Young, our Administrative Assistant, who also handles all of our social media. Hi. Hope everybody's doing okay today. Rebecca, it's so nice to have you here. It's so nice and to be here. Our special guest today is Studio M artist Rebecca Cross who has exhibited her work nationally and internationally, including in New York City, Sweden, Paris, Budapest, and Nagoya, Japan. She was selected for this exhibition as the Cannes Triennial Award winner back in 2018 for her artwork titled Gyre, which we will see a, um, an image of in a moment. Um, but uh, Alex Kuhn, our executive director, and I visited the Cannes Triennial Exhibition and selected Rebecca's work uh, for the exhibition prize. And we were just so moved by her installation and we were also very excited to be able to invite an artist to actually create a site-specific installation in our relatively new Studio M space at Maslin Museum. So, Rebecca, would you like to tell us a little bit about that artwork? Sure. Uh, Gyre was a piece that I made as part of a series of four elemental installation pieces. And this, the one that you chose for the prize, Gyre, was, um, was really a piece about water. And um, uh, we recently, I'm from the Pacific Northwest, but of the United States, but um, we recently in the last several years have been spending a lot of time um, at a house we bought on Lake Erie in the western part of New York. So I've been, I've become really attached to Lake Erie and um, the lot for all of the time I've been making art, um, I um, have been working with tying silk around rocks and I wanted to do so for this entry into the Can uh, Triennial, um, which was a tremendous undertaking by, you know, Michael Gill and Christy Gray and Bill Busta, a bunch of people just really did a beautiful job of really focusing on regional artists um, to coincide or to show, you know, in tandem with the Front Triennial International Exhibition that also began that year. So it was really, you know, kudos to them. And I know the next one's been postponed for a year because of the pandemic, but I think we will prevail. Uh, I had tied rocks, uh, um, lake rocks into silk, and I was so struck by how typically I tie the rocks and they'll hold uh, I'll dye the rocks or wet the rocks and they will, you know, hold the shape of that rock once they've dried. But um, in this case, um, I, I wanted to draw on the silk. <laughs> so I was tying rocks, uh, boiling them to get them to, you know, mold to the shape of the rock. And then I was drawing on them. And I found that all of the, the, the little tiny marks that I was making that were really derived from the surface of these lake rocks, some of them quite large, um, had this kind of landscape apparent appearance. There was something very um, <clears throat> uh, poetic and beautiful about the, the, the gestures that were sort of in, on these rocks. Um, the rocks I'm showing now that I'm hanging from the ceiling at the beautiful Maslin Museum are um, more smooth, they're, they're rounder and I, I've also treated them. But anyway, so Gyre was one of those and I created a big circle of these tied rock sculptures that were drawn on and then um, put a bunch of ribbons, uh, dyed, hand dyed silk ribbons hanging from the ceiling to sort of create this water effect. And I was very pleased um, with how it came out. And 
uh, and then I made one at the AG Gallery called um, uh, Fire. I can't remember the time spacing on the title right now, but um, there, there was one that I uh, that I put up at AG Gallery called um, About Fire, and it was uh, the second of the series. And then I did a kind of an Earth one at Bay Arts last October, where I felted rocks and had them on the floor, and they were all tied up to um, to a single point up in the ceiling. Um, <clears throat> and then this is the one that's really about air. So it's been very, I knew the air part would come and it would be problematic and difficult and interesting, an interesting challenge. And I really have, I really understand this piece more as about as much about atmosphere as it is about air. So it just, it has a lot to do with light and color and um, what's there and what's not there and shadows. So, yeah. And the one other uh, feature of the, the piece that, that won the prize, Gyre, was that um, it, I used and posted next to the piece a poem that a dear friend of mine, Marco Wilkinson, who used to live in Oberlin where I live, but now has moved to San Diego with his husband, Kazim Ali. They're both poets and writers. Uh, I used a, a, a narrative poem of his that, that, was, um, that was titled the same, Chire. So, and that was lovely to have that as part of the exhibit. I'm gonna share my screen so those of uh, our audience who are looking at the video of this can see a couple of images of gyre. So you can see the silk that's dyed, the drawing, and the ribbons coming down. I, I just loved, both of us loved how when standing in front of this piece, you just have an experience um, from all directions. And so you really feel like you're enveloped and yes. That's something that I would encourage anybody who is able to, who's in Northeastern Ohio, to come please experience this exhibition of Rebecca Cross's um, for yourself in person if you can, because it is um, just very moving. I find it meditative. Um, you know, even though it deals with an environmental theme that, you know, is a serious theme. It is, I find, a very healing experience to stand and view her artworks in the um, Massillon Museum exhibition. So that one is the one here at MassMU is titled Suspended Animations. And I'm gonna show on the screen a few from the series, Horizon series. And Rebecca, you can tell us about the images that I pull up, um, especially for our audio listeners. Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, <clears throat> these pieces all came from or are derived in some way from spending a great deal of time contemplating uh, the Lake Erie horizon. So um, where I stay, uh, there's, we're right on the water and I spend an inordinate amount of time. I actually, if the, what, in almost any weather, I spend just as much time outside as possible. I just want to it's, it's amazing how calming it is and how perpetually interesting the skyline is. I, you know, my friends who follow me on social media know that I post pictures of sunsets and cloud formations and, you know, night skies sometimes even um, from that place. And it really is ever changing. What happens in these pieces is that I've, I've done dye work to create these horizon lines um, that, um, are, are dyed similarly on the front and the back of the fabric. So they're two attached pieces of silk organza, which is a kind of, it's that it's, there are many different weaves of, of silk fabric, but silk organza is the one that has, um, uh, the, the retains this excretion of the silkworm called saracen, which is what makes the silk crispy. Give it, it gives it that crispy hand, that crisp hand that sewers will talk about. It's often used for weddings because it's very um, light and sort of uh, sculptural almost. Uh, and it's, um, 
and it takes dyes beautifully. But what happens is it's translucent enough that when you have two layers of sort of the same color information in these color fields, there really is kind of a movement between the two fields that that sort of makes the 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 work kind of shimmer. And um, and I, I I wanted to do some drawing also on these. Um, so um, I decided I was trying different kinds of media. And so I was trying to use, I first tried to use watercolor pencils, watercolors, uh, it just, the paint was not working. And graphite wasn't, um, showed some, so there is some graphite in these, but I realized that chalk pastels, even more than oil pastels, which are quite, are a little bit heavier, um, offered a kind of um, almost, other layer of information on the piece that just was um, sort of unexpectedly light and uh, delicate the way the silk operated also. So it was very interesting to me. And then the more I looked at them, the more I realized that they had this quality, not just of having, you know, these color feeling, looking like color fields from a distance, but as you got closer, they had these drawn elements on them. Um, there also was this capacity for um, the pastels to show differently when you were looking at them head on versus when you went to the side of the piece and looked at them. And sometimes from the side, those chalk marks would just pop like you can see in that picture. So it was really interesting process and very much in keeping with themes around ethereality, ephemerality, transformation, change, you know, all those things that are um, time, they're just, you know, sort of stalwarts of my um, my thinking about my work and the conceptual foundation of almost all my work, memory, you know, so. Well, what a wonderful discovery to make alongside the process, you know, trying different materials, looking from yes. more than one perspective. And that's what makes seeing your exhibition such an experience that you can see it one way and then you shift just slightly and then suddenly this beautiful drawing is revealed and sometimes the drawing is extremely subtle. In fact, there were some aspects of the drawing that I wasn't able to photograph. You literally, you have to experience them in person because person. you just, um, you know, they're, they're revealed in such a way that the camera can't really capture it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's wonderful to, to hear about the process and the discoveries you made as you were making this work. They also, what's interesting is that the whole, you know, I made these drawings because I wanted the long time of drawing, you know, doing these drawings. And what I realized is that in perceiving these drawings and as they're, you know, in their finished state or in their experience, it really requires moving around it as if it were sculpture, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's interesting that I'm doing something that's two dimensional, that still retains some necessary function by the viewer or in the viewer of treating it like it's a three dimensional object. So I just thought of that. <laughs> well, that's true. That's really interesting. And they do, well, they actually, they are three dimensional in the sense that they they uh, kind of float in front yes, yes. of the wall. They're not flat against the wall. And then there's right. the two they're layers. Subject. Sure, right. they're subject to the atmosphere and moving. And in fact, I've worked a lot with dancers, um, costuming them, creating sets for them, uh, particularly Cora Radella of Double Edge Dance Company. And it is a dance that you do with the piece to look at it, to see it fully. You know, there really is this, this performative aspect. So, yeah. So I think you can see, and for our audio listeners, the photographs show how the silk um, kind of has an undulating edge at the bottom and there's a shadow underneath so that you can kind of see through the first layer of silk into the other layer. And this is a detail of one of your horizon pieces and it's, it's hard to, to appreciate the depth, but I was trying to capture in the photograph how there's a one image and then there's kind of a ghost image mm -hmm. behind it. And it yeah. reminds me of looking underwater or, you know, seeing, um, 
a shadow that's you know maybe glist glistening or glittering or moving as the sun is shining through space right and which of course is my continuous experience on the water so I finally got a kayak last year and mm. when I'm on the water it is extraordinary that way because it does have this 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 light that goes deep um, depending upon when and, and where you are uh, the other feature of the surface that's complicated is that when uh, silk is um, created into fat, woven with this really fine thread that has Saracen silk, in order to size the fabric, it's run through what are called calendaring presses. And what happens with the calendaring presses is that they they make they they make uniform the size of the fabric from the woven cloth, and they also create these kind of weird, um, sort of fluid-looking surface. Uh, forms on the top of the fabric so that adds another you know um feet another piece of, of of you know sort of distortion when you're looking mm. at them that i think you know adds to that adds to the sort of elusiveness of it which is sort of the point you know i mean how are these mm. things how do things stay how do they elude us what is you know the natural cycle of things um, and certainly the cycle of things in times of environmental collapse and cataclysm are very, very fluid, you know, so. Wow. Anna, did you have a question or a couple of questions for Rebecca having to do with her process and material? Yeah, so first question, um, what kind of mood do you go into the studio with? What kind of mood? Yes. That's so interesting. Well, you know, mostly I'm angry all the time these days. You know, the world is so crazy. You know, it's hard it's hard to be a, a, an other in any way, any respect in our culture. It's hard to be a woman. It's hard to be a person of color, et cetera. Um, I bring my whole life into my studio. I bring my whole life into my thinking. And frankly, my studio is just a, a space that I go to to execute work. But my actual studio, Anna's in my head. It's with me everywhere all the time. You know, I sometimes think that I became an artist because I needed to figure out a way to be more, to more productively use that kind of brain chatter that's part of being an, a sentient, intelligent being. And, um, I, I, you know, I, I, when I hung the show last week, for example, I came, I left and I was exhausted and I was gratified and I was grateful. And I was like, I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> I'm just going to just knit for a while and read some books. And honestly, within a day, I had my sketchbook out and I was already mm -hmm. planning the next work, you know, so it is, um, my studio is a, almost a symbol of the how I am allowed to honor the space to make the work that I make my work in and my studio here in Oberlin is beautiful it's in one of those old brick you know structures in many small Ohio towns and my husband sort of his his graduation gift to me when I got my MFA you know back when I was in my 40s um, was this was this space and he's a composer and has his own studio for composing music so um, there's definitely that resonance for, um, you know, respecting the, the need for one's own room, uh, to quote Virginia Woolf uh, sideways. Um, so I think there's that. Um, so I bring all of my moods into the studio, you know, but I do have to say the prevalent one, that one these days is so much frustration. Mm -hmm. But um, but I know I share that with everybody and, uh, and I'm, I'm truly, truly, everyone says this, but I'm truly blessed and grateful that I get to do this, that I get to make things, you know. Yeah. That's a great answer. Um, and I know that um, Emily and I as artists as well can relate to that too. And so I kind of want to go a little bit further with that um, more on a, maybe a lighthearted note. Um, maybe not. <laughs> um, I can do lighthearted. <laughs> do you listen to music when you create work? Um, if so, what is your top hit in the studio? Oh my God. I, you know, I was first studied music. So my tastes are very, very wide ranging, Anna. So I actually, um, yes, I do. The answer is yes. I listen to music. I also listen to books on tape. 
Um, and, um, and what I've done, and I, I think I actually do listen to books on tape more than to music, um, which is, you know, complicated, but uh, I've been reading the entire works of Toni Morrison, the, listening to the entire works of Louise Erdrich. I've just been sort of choosing authors who I love. I also read a lot of, um, and I think this, this sort of feeds into the sci-fi or fantastical features of my conceptual thinking. I listen to a lot of like post-apocalyptic, you know, fiction, uh, you know, future fantasy stuff. That really is a, a genre that I've, I've, I really love. Um, especially when it's written by women like Ursula Le Guin or, <laughs> um, uh, so I, I really, um, I really love that. And, um, but music, I, I, I'm crazy about Patti Smith and I love, um, Cat Power and I adore the National and Deerhoof is like a band that we are close friends with because their drummer is a dear friend and a former student of my husband. So like indie rock, I really love, but I could listen to opera. And I can listen, or, or the other thing I did is I started listening to the entire, all of the string quartets of Beethoven. So they're really, as a classical, classically trained musician who also really loved, you know, going to concerts, which I still do, um, with my dear friend, Doris Polo, who's a painter in Cleveland, we often go to live music concerts together. It's kind of our thing. We've really missed it lately. <laughs> Um, it's just, yeah, just, just a wide range. You know, I mostly listen to women musicians playing mostly. So if I have to choose, but yeah, so. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've already yeah. alluded a little bit about how you're, um, you know, you bring everything to your artwork, your whole life. And, and you've actually, you said you got your MFA more recently but you were it experienced other fields and um, music and also English and writing. So are there ways that that has um, become evident in your work or you know, kind of worked in tandem with your art practice? You did yeah. mention the poem with Jire yeah. that you know, Alex yes. and I both read that as part of the experience. Yes, so exactly. So that's really, yeah. Yeah. No, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I think that, yes, I do feel, and, in, you know, and I do feel this way very, I feel this way in a profound sense about being a teacher of art too, you know, so I spent a lot of my time, my life teaching. Um, so why I mentioned the teaching is because um, I got like three thoughts ahead of myself, was that when I teach, I'm constantly using um musical metaphors right and when i'm teaching composition to to you know written composition to artists who are trying to learn how to write artist statements or to write grants or describe their work or promote their work um i really need them to understand that the process of composing words is not is not only not different from composing art in other words, you look critically at what you've put out there and you keep having this conversation with it, but it also can help you to use another sort of scaffolding that you use for art and apply it to writing or vice versa can be really, really helpful. So I think that all of this, all of the ways in which we communicate and compose as movers, as speakers, as makers, they're connected, you know, I mean, they're all, um, they're one of the one of the piece of of us, you know. They're pieces of us that that come together in really interesting ways. So, um, I think how I I think one of the reasons why I felt confident or even had the it's more like I had the hoods, but to become an artist, a serious artist at a you know in my forties was that I had been looking at art seriously as a trained musician, as a trained writer and reader. Um, you know, my whole adult life. So I felt like I really did have this critical disposition towards what was visual that was going to serve me really well as a, not just as a teacher, but also as an artist, you know, so, and, and I think it does. And um, yeah, again, it's really, it's kind of weirdly related to what we were talking about with these horizon pieces. It's like, there are so many perspectives to be taken, right, in, in our, you know, in how we understand the world and how we communicate with it. So, yeah. 
I just have to tell you, and I, I don't say this for every Studio M exhibition, but I had um, I had so much fun working with you, you know, more closely because over the past couple of years, you've visited the museum on numerous occasions, and um, you know, a lot of the artists who have a show pretty much like ready to go up on the walls, they know what's included. It's a little bit different. So I've gotten to spend more time with you, which has been a great experience. And um, just putting this together with you, when the show was up, I, I just had this like, I got chills when I was in the gallery because oh, wow. it was just so moving and so beautiful. Thank you. And I haven't shown the images of your installation yet. Here's a picture oh, of yeah. Anna in front of it. That looks great. So this is the process that you talked about earlier where you wrap the silk around rocks and they retain the memory of that of those forms. What is the name of that process? It's called Shibori. Um, S-H-I-B-O-R-I, -I. it's a Japanese word, which essentially means to tie, T-I-E. Um, and um, yes, and it is, it is particular, to, even though tie, you know, this, this tying and shaping of fabric to create textures in kimono, for example, when they do little, little tiny, 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 tiny little ties um, with just thread, and then take them out and there's this kind of tech bumpy texture to the to the fabric that is a form of shibori shibori also applies to when you fold fabric and clamp it to resist it or you stitch it to resist it or you tie it around a pole and wrap it with a string and compress it so any act of compressing fabric and then dyeing it um, to transform it in terms of color or form um, is what shibori is. So, um, and when I had that show in Japan, someone from a news television news place in in the uh, in the prefecture uh, called to to ask if they could ask some questions, and they asked me if I knew what shibori meant, and I could. <laughs> I was so proud of myself because so I was like, "Yes, shibori was first identified in the ninth century, Nara." <laughs> um, you know. So anyway, it was just really funny. Um, uh, so. Yes, it that's what it is. And it and in with silk organza, what's really cool is that because as I explained earlier, that that sticky stuff that's left in the silk fabric mm -hmm. in the threads, on the threads, it's not scoured, it's not removed before it's made into because most silk we think of as being really fluid and silky, but silk organza is pretty stiff, right? It's still very soft and fluid, but it's pretty stiff. Um that's what makes the that's what makes it possible to sort of create they're almost like skins like creating mm -hmm. a skin around an object and for me that is a fascinating feature of it and it's one of the reasons why they not only have this biomorphic feeling because they're quite soft as well as translucent as well as holding the shape but they also have this kind of um what was i thinking like this I don't know, they, they suggest a tracing. They suggest the skin, a remainder of, uh, they suggest mm -hmm. what's left, what's been mm -hmm. culled, you know? And I think that, that that part of it for me metaphorically is really powerful. Besides which every single time I untie an object and take it out of the silk and I have that little silky puffy object sitting there I'm like I can't believe I get to do this all the time it never <laughs> ceases to like give me incredible pleasure you know it's just really satisfying so yes well to describe this piece just a little bit for those of um, our audience who are only listening to the audio part of this you can see these uh, cascading shibori forms of the silk that has the echo of these rocks and then at, at various points at the bottom of the um, silver colored cables that they are actually suspended from the ceiling so you have rocks that are drawn on with chalk and they're at lots of different levels in the gallery so there's a feeling of kind of weightlessness and yet they're rocks so they they come from the earth and did can you remind us again 
um, how this piece relates to the others in this series? I know yes. you said so earlier, but now that we're looking at an image. Yes. So um, the piece that you chose for this exhibition was, was just the remaining shapes from the rocks. Mm -hmm. um, Raining Fire was the red one. I couldn't remember the title of, of earlier that I had at the American Greetings Gallery. That was many, 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 many ribbons, red, red dyed ribbons coming down from uh, the ceiling. And then they, they sort of fell into a trough of um, silk shapes that were shaped around rocks that had also been bleached. So they were kind of corroding around the, you know, in the center of the circles, in the center of the spheres. And uh, so that was the other one. And then the one that I had at Bayard, the earth one, which was called um, the something of resistance. I can't remember the, the something. Anyway, I'll, it'll come back to me. Um, it uh, was felted rocks that, um, that, were just on the ground, but they were, they were being pulled to, a, to on very tight lines to one point in the ceiling. And that was sort of more simple, although it was pretty complicated to put up and stuff. And, um, there, and I have to blame Kristen Cliffel, my beloved friend, who's just an amazing artist because she's always on me about creating titles for actual titles for my work. I used to, everything was always untitled for a long time. <laughs> and now I'm grateful to her for that because I really love words, but then I can't always pull the words out of my head <laughs> um, <laughs> right immediately. So um, I think it was called the weight of resistance. I think that's what it was yeah. called. The weight of resistance. W-E-I-G-H-T. That's what it was. Yeah. So Got it. yeah. Gyre, yeah. rain, fire, the weight of resistance, and now suspended animations. Woo! I did all four. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I feel like titling pieces is always, it's just, it's so stressful. It puts so much pressure Yes. On, on you you're like okay I made the piece well why do I have to put even more pressure on myself again come on right and you feel like maybe you're going to interfere with the viewers you know notion of what this mm -hmm. is especially I mean I don't know I don't know how even to describe my work is it is it abstract I don't know is it you mm -hmm. know so yes but sometimes it's also helpful and I think don't you it's definitely it's definitely helpful especially when you know if you're trying to have this kind of narrative conversation with the viewer and right. there's something that you couldn't directly put into the piece. It just adds that little bit of extra information that really kind of almost sets the stage to view yes. the piece. So it's, and that's, I think why it's just, it's so much more pressure <laughs> that you have yeah. to really be, you know, you have to take into consideration all of those things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's a different language. You have the visual language and you have the, you know, the words and it's making a tie between the two, but I tend to agree that titles are really important and I mean I I love it when all of an artist's works are titled and it kind of I don't want to say it irks me but <laughs> I do I yearn for You're that little bit of just this power of suggestion to kind of you know as Anna said set the stage for the viewer yes yeah. yeah. so, yeah yeah cool so i wanted to mention um, i'm not sure what slide it's in i think it's this next one here um, that there is a wonderful article written about this exhibition by the artist and writer douglas max utter um, that can be viewed on canjournal.org, or of course it was um, also in the physical magazine. Um, I believe it was the last issue, not the current issue. And he writes about the aspect of time in your work. And I do want to see um, state, I just thought it was such a beautiful piece of writing about, um, about this. Yes, it so, was. And I read about it even before I got to see, you know, that many examples of the work that you were making for the show. Um, so he concluded, life itself is a chemistry experiment of inconceivable length and titanic scale. And he wrote about how the forms that you drew onto the silk um, 
it's almost like you're seeing these remnants of the past or even alluding to a, a future. You, you talked about that in the, in the um, books on tape that you, or the audio books that you listen to that you're interested in yeah. that yeah. like mm -hmm. aspect of time and memory. Um, do you have any thoughts about his article and? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, I, when Doug wrote the article, I, I, I really had to just take a moment to, to breathe in the beauty of it. It was really extraordinary. It's an extraordinary gift to have some testament to your work um, written by such an amazing artist and writer. And when I called him, I said, okay, Doug, I think I can just quit being an artist now. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. He said, no, I said, I'm just kidding. But no, I think that the, I, I think the, you know, I think I'm influenced by a lot of different artists and I think that that plays out in these, but I think, um, Yes, when I st first started making, um, using these techniques in my work, I thought of them almost as mapped terrains, right? I was doing these, these, these shapes and things. And then I realized they really did have this biomorphia to them. They really felt like these, bi these, these, these creatures almost, or like floral or plant forms. And I'm fascinated and take way too many pictures of plants and the details of plants all the time. It's really a fascination of mine. And a lot of the early pieces that led to this work were thinking about these, creating these little sculptures that were you know, attached to plexiglass and topped with etched glass from drawings I'd done, like these drawings on the silk horizons horizon pieces like the drawing I'd done on the rocks from the can you know from gyre um, I realized they really felt to me like they sort of became in my imagination these little natural history objects that were um, that we'd see some distant time into the future that were all that were left of the, the many, many plant species and animal species that we're going to be losing because of climate change, right? So it was a way to sort of say, I see you, you are beautiful, and I'm going to try to make something that reminds me of you because you're so beautiful. That's also beautiful. And then we're going to have this memory of the skin of this object or this plant or this animal in, you know, a hundred years from now, 200 years from now, when this thing is no more. So, so I think that notion of how, you know, putting your thumbprint on something or making something does hold a very particular history of that moment. You know, it's, it's really a marking of that particular moment in time and history. And so um, it's a really valiant and courageous act, I think, to make art knowing that or believing in that, um, it takes a lot of courage. And um, so, so, and what, what more can we do? You know, I think that, I think that it's, I always tell my students that making art is a really highly ethical act because I believe it is because you really are doing something that is a creative response to something else. And you're really making something that's, that's, that's about making meaning. And that is, important you know really really is important um and i am i am i am so i i love the natural world so much i've spent so much time in it in the northwest in alaska as a, as a child i mean as a teenager in japan as a child you know all kinds of outdoor activities hiking camping skiing fishing everything and i i every time i make an object that 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 makes me think about this beautiful attendance that I've paid to these gorgeous places um, and lets me do it in sort of an, you know, a, a sculptural setting involving silk. It makes me feel like it's a prayer. Or it's like a, 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 a gesture of, of gratitude for the beauty that is around us that is so threatened. You know, I think it's, it's like, it's incomprehensible really to go too far far into that thinking because it's so unbelievable um but and scary frankly but um anyway so yeah i was that that article was really is a really extraordinary piece of writing and um yeah <laughs> yeah well i've yeah. told you this before yeah. but i loved how the just the way he was able to 
make the leap from the specific um, elegance of the way that you've drawn on the silk to the, the broader underlying concept behind all of the work. I just, mm. uh, yes. you know, it's like, wow, there it is. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, he is a very thoughtful questioner. He's an extremely astute observer. And he is the, one of the most learned people I know. He has a, he's a huge reader, just a huge reader and a, con, a huge, serious consumer of art. You know, it's really, really something. He's really an extraordinary gift to our larger community. He really is. He's really special. Well, to, to jump a, a little bit, um, I know Anna and I both had questions about your artistic influences. And you spoke to me early on of the art, the British artist Tacita Dean. And um, would you like to tell us how you're so moved by her work and describe it a little bit for folks who maybe aren't familiar with her work um, that so they can go and look it up? Sure, sure. Um, you know, my, my, I would say my primary influence, at, you know, my, the primary influence on my work have been, um, have been Anne Hamilton and Picasso. Anne Hamilton, because everything she touches is just miraculous. And I think Anna had, had, had prepped me with a question about who I would love to show with. And she's the one. I've heard her lecture a few times. Every time I hear a lecture, I talk to her afterwards. And she's just the most gracious, generous human being. And I just, she's really extraordinary. She's really, it. And, um, and Picasso, I love to, to look at because he always does whatever the he wants to do you know what I mean he just does it and I love the courage he makes me feel because he's like he every every piece seems to have this aspect of play in it and I think that that's mm -hmm. really quite special and quite unusual and bespeaks his tremendous productivity right yeah. uh, I find it I find it very encouraging I also adore Cy Twombly I think his paintings and the scale in which he works and the way that he attends to beauty which is a really important consideration for me um, is really really something really really and he sometimes writes on stuff I just there's a kind of uh, freedom in his expression that I I truly admire um but to see the Dean, the reason to see the Dean, I mean, I've loved her work forever and this is why. So I saw her work back in 1990 at the, of all things, my husband was teaching in London. It was at the Tate, um, not the Tate, the, the old Tate, but it was for the big um, Turner Prize that they have every year in England where they award a prize and then two finalists an ex exhibition um, at the um, at the Tate. And uh, Chris O'Feely, who's the guy who did those tremendous portraits with elephant dung attached to them because it was a sacred thing in the religious system. He was exploring the African religious system. He's exploring those paintings, was the prize winner. And then to see to Dean, and I can't remember the other artist who was also really interesting. I can't remember her name. Anyway, at this moment, to see to Dean is mostly a filmmaker which I also find really interesting because she's really interested in moving images. And she's done a lot of work looking at the sea. She's a British artist. She looks at the sea and she's done the things that I adore in her work are these gigantic drawings that are usually pretty monochromatic and they are kind of seascapes or mountainscapes. Mm -hmm. They're just these, these, these really really sort of generous and striking and dramatic all at once pieces I just adore. But what I saw um, at the Tate that year was um, she had several paintings that were uh, displayed near a film, which was basically a film of a, a, a like a bell in a, in a lighthouse, you know, or some kind of ship's bell, I think, as, as I recall, this was a long time ago. And then but her drawings were these gorgeous, they were almost like Homer, you know, they were these gorgeous drawings of um, fishermen and their boats. Mm -hmm. And there were notes in the margins, like I was talking about with Cy Twombly, it's the little scribbles of notes. And, and, but the most extraordinary thing was that you got, as you got closer to look at them, you realized, oh my God, I don't even want to breathe because they were done with chalk on, on mm -hmm. like chalkboard or mm -hmm. on these black fields. 
And it looked like if you breathe, that we just blow away. And the whole idea of being in this huge institution of art, spending my entire semester in London, looking at art and all these great, just being an artist made me think, oh my God, you know, what is, what a risky, amazing thing to do that you would draw something that, that could just be so uh, um, easily removed, so mm -hmm. delicate, so ephemeral. And I, and when, so when I started applying chalk to these drawings, these horizon drawings, I was like, this really, it was so resonant with that experience with Decida Dean, you know, so, so that's, uh, you know, and I, I guess I could go on and on about other influences, but I'm also really interested in Julie Moreto's work because she does these drawings that have this, you know, often they have uh, translucent papers that are, are, are on other papers and the way that she does creates a depth of field on one, you know, two dimensional plane in these drawings that are so exuberant, it's so grounded at once, uh, just, you know, slays me every time, so. Wow. Well, lots of influences, and I would like to learn more about their work as well. Because, and I, I hope to be able to one day t see uh, to see the dean in person. Because certainly, just looking online, there's no way to appreciate the scale. No. And of course, you have to have the moving image and Absolutely. you know projected, not just a little screen. Yeah. It's worth Googling to see to Dean Wexner and Kent State University, though, because she did do a residency at the Wexner, like, I don't know, in 2015, I was reading about this recently, and I missed it. I didn't even oh. know. I mean, I was, I think I was, I was doing other things at that point, yes. but, um, but uh, yeah, anyway, so, and she did something with the Robert Smithson mystery on the Kent campus, et cetera, so it's worth reading about. Wonderful. Anna, would you like to ask some of your questions? Well, I mean, you have already answered uh, the question about collaboration. So awesome. Um, I do have a question about, um, do you recall one moment as an artist that made you feel justified in the work that you were creating, like any kind of maybe recognition, maybe not even a, a public moment, but a private moment where it just kind of was like that moment yeah. of clarity for you? You know, Anna, I am, I am, I am serious enough to believe that what I am doing is something as an artist is something that is definitely related to a the, the larger human world, the community, community of the wonderful, incredibly generous and so excellent community of artists within which I work. And hello, everybody, you know who you are. I mean, I just, I'm so grateful to be where I am, frankly. Um, but I also think that um, probably, I, I, I made a promise to myself early on that I was not going to let rejections slay me. In other words, I wasn't going to let anything get in the way of my continuing to make work because I could see how important making art was to my own personal survival, period. I mean, it was like, this is a commitment I'm making to myself. And I think all of us owe ourselves that, that space to sort of self-actualize, right? I think that that is to be human in a supportive environment. And of course we serve each other too, but I think there are these places that are just ours. So I would say where I feel most, the times that I felt most like an artist have been when that's been challenged. So when I've been rejected, my response has been, uh, see ya, I'm headed to my studio now and just you wait, right? Mm. Or if I'm, if someone says, or if someone acts like I, I'm a bad penny when I'm in their presence, I'm like, you know what? I'm just doing my work. I'm just doing my work, you know? So I, and I think that we, I think if we're committed and we work, um, I think I've been incredibly lucky with the amount of attention and opportunities I've had. I'm really grateful. And I feel like I'm approaching the point where I also wanna do more to help support and bring up younger artists into the fold, right? I think that's part of increasingly as I age, I'm 59, I'll be 60. And I feel like part of my job is to 
to put my shoulders out there so people can other people can stand on them but um but I'm also very young as an artist I'm only you know 15 20 years in as an artist myself so I I have to accommodate to my aging body too you know uh but yeah I think that's that's really that's how I feel about it that that we are we get to give ourselves permission and I feel most centered when someone's pushing up against that and they force me to just reestablish my gra- my footing and just say, I- I'm doing the work. I'm going to close my door now. Hmm. Love that. <laughs> I feel that it's like a heat, yeah. you know? That yes. Is- yes. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's not even a negative thing. It's just that all right. All right. It's a clarity. It's a discernment. It's a kind of moment of clarity is really, and I think it's essential because if you don't get that piece of it out of your way, you're not going to be able to make anything. You know, if you're going to make something, you need to be there. And if you're somewhere else, because you're worried about what other people are thinking or, you know, it's, it's, it can really, it's an interference. Yeah. yeah. I want to see your work, Anna. <laughs> I don't know your work. We'll talk. <laughs> okay. Okay. So speaking of getting back in the studio, and as you said, after doing this, you know, even just installing this, you're already in your sketchbook thinking about what you're doing next. Do you want to share anything about a next direction or are, are you ready to to just say, wait, (laughs) wait and see. (laughs) Well, you know, the truth is it was so funny doing this exhibition because Doug needed me because of can deadlines. Doug needed me to, he needed images and to interview me about this show in January, right? Mm -hmm. And so I typically would have, I already had a good idea of what I was doing. I was already thinking, I need to think a lot. I, I just need a lot of time and space around work to think, but This was very far away from the moment of, and the thinking I wanted to do was over months so that I could actually revise as I was making, right? So, but um, yeah, so um, I would, so I'm leaving this, this exhibition feeling very gratified and it's great. So I've been thinking lately though, that maybe I want to do some, uh, some smaller pieces. Some of the things I've done before, car, you know, etching or carving into plexi and then creating a, a shelf for a piece that way or a frame or a cover, those are kind of some other ideas that I'd like to pursue further. And I spent a lot of time at Thinkbox to do those, you know, to translate those drawings into etchings. I'm also, I really have this kind of thing in the back of my head that I've had for many, many, many years about wanting to paint. And I, so... Part of me thinks that I may, I often, like I'll, I'll make little side forays into pretty bad pottery making or into, you know, a, you know, pretty bad knitting or whatever, uh, because I, I like to stay busy, but I, I, I think I may just give myself over to maybe to another medium just for a time, just to live in another medium for a minute, you know? So that's as far, that, is that vague enough? <laughs> <laughs> just talk about what I'm doing next I will have a show though next spring with Kathy Black and Taryn McMahon um, okay. at Hedge Gallery so I'm very excited and that actually will be speaking of, speaking of collaborations Anna that will be something where I'm hoping that three of us can do sort of pieces that we work on together and I'm looking forward to that because we've been so I said I think I need a little stretch and a little literal touch time with other artists you know so oh well that's going to be very exciting I'm looking forward to that I am (laughs) I'll be right downstairs so it'll be easy for me to pop up um, and see the exhibition so so great that's so great Anna thanks (laughs) wonderful well I want to make sure that I mention as we're getting wrapped up that You've got to come and see this show in person. The show itself, Suspended Animations, is up in Studio M Gallery until June 16th. You can reserve a spot to our extended gallery artist hours with the artist and see Rebecca herself. That takes place on June 12th from 5 to 7 p.m. 
and during our normal gallery hours you don't need a reservation you do need a reservation for the june 12th event and you can find that at massmu.org forward slash tickets and um i know you know as I said before, this is one to be experienced in person. If, if you have the opportunity to do so, please come and see the exhibition. We're just so pleased to have Rebecca Cross as our, our first Cannes Triennial Exhibition Award winner um, here at Maslin Museum. So thank you for sharing some about your background, your thinking process, how your artwork relates to music and writing and life. And Anna, I don't know if you wanted to chime in if you have some final questions. I just wanted to say thank you so much for having this amazing conversation with us. It's so wonderful to learn about your studio practice and just your life tips and wisdom, honestly. So thank you very much. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing how future shows develop. No matter what material you're using, I'm sure that there will be a presence um, in your work. Sure. Thank you, Emily. And I want to say in particular, Emily, it has been such a joy to work with you. And you've been so on top of everything. You've been my own little personal you know, calendar organizer human. Mm -hmm. I'm just so grateful and also so generous with your thoughts and, and, and time and uh, reflections on my work. Thank you for that. It really means a lot. The Maslin Museum would like to extend a huge thank you to our operating grantors, Arts and Stark and the Ohio Arts Council for making programs like this possible. We'd also like to thank Matt O'Ness for giving us a podcast idea in the first place. 